Mary Calvi is currently the co-anchor of New York CBS 2 Morning News. That's Channel 2, by the way. Uh, and also CBS 2 at noon. Did you anchor the noon cast I just, today? I just came back. So if you have any questions about the news today, I'm here. I can customize the newscast. So whatever you'd like. She's a recipient of numerous News Emmy Awards, including coverage of the Miracle on the Hudson. That was the 2009 emergency landing of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, whose anniversary, you may recall, was just on January 15th. She's also been honored for her investigative reporting on sexual pedophiles. As a reporter, she's covered stories ranging from profiles of the FBI's underwater anti-terrorism team. And what did you have to go through for that that I read about, Mary? Yeah, what did I was you do? pretty sensitive because we went underwater with the team. Before I worked with the FBI, I did something with NASA as well. And I went underwater with the astronauts. So you had to get extensive certification to do that. And um, I wasn't quite ready for what I needed to go through. But it was what it was. So you make it says, out. journalism is a dull job. <laughs> Okay, she has one, oh, well, she also covered John Paul II um, from Rome, so she got to travel there to report on the Pope. Uh, she covered the first World Trade Center attack, that was back in 1993, and of course 9-11. She's won a National ACE Award for Excellence in Journalism and a Clarion Award for Excellence in Reporting. She graduated magna cum laude, sorry I have to say this, from Syracuse University. <laughs> She has a degree in journalism. She began her broadcasting career in radio. She moved on to television at News 12 Westchester. And Mary and I actually share that in common. I worked for another News 12 division in my career, so we have some folks in common. It is a small world in journalism at times. So start that networking as early as you can. She also did work for USA Networks, and again, is now at CBS too. She is also the author of the new book, you can kind of tell what that's about, right? Dear George, Dear Mary, a novel of George Washington's first love. It's an historical novel which will be released later this month. She'll be talking about that as well as journalism today. But please join me in welcoming Mary Cowdy to St. John's University. So wherever you're comfortable, um, I thought we'd start with a uh, few questions that I'll ask Mary that she can talk about. There will be an opportunity later for all of you to ask some questions too. Uh, Mary has a presentation that she'll make, so we have a lot of time, but not as much time as you think. So let's begin. So first question, why did you get into journalism? Why not finance, marketing, all those, those other are great. really I don't know what I was thinking. Um, truthfully, I think that I knew early on that I wanted to be a journalist um, because I like telling stories. I wasn't really thinking about television at the time. I was thinking about being a newspaper journalist. And um, so that's really where it started. I was one of those kids who just liked to um, write stories and talk about stories. Not necessarily, you know, uh, stories about things that happened to me, but things that happened to other people. And so I, I, that really um, was early on, probably even before high school, I was thinking about the journalism. So you mentioned print to then transitioning to broadcast. Where did that light bulb go off in your head? Honestly, I was even thinking about newspaper journalism when I was in college. I was just a professor who said, Mary, I think you should try to do this television journalism. Um, I think you could be a good broadcaster, and so um, I really didn't really think about it seriously until I got my first internship in the summer while I was in college, and uh, that's when I started moving into television because I was able to get a little bit of tape and you know some clips, and that's that's how it started. Well, you guys know what tape is, right? <laughs> oh yeah. <I'm> <laughs> and we used to have like actual tape. they were like gigantic sized tapes back then. So you guys have a um, so talk about your college career. So you mentioned internships, maybe some of the courses you taught. Syracuse is a wonderful new house school of communications, a great school. Um, but some of the things that you went through as a student that maybe our students can learn from. So this is what I would absolutely suggest. First off, I would say that the people that you're here right now with are not your competition. Um, you are going to meet each other throughout your career. Television is a very small world. We all know each other, and we all really rely on each other. So I would say get to know just your classmates first because you're going to be able to help each other out because you'll have a uh, meteorologist who says, wait, there's a news reporter opening, and the news reporter will say, wait, there's a director opening, and honestly, you're going to be able to help each other out. So I would network here first and then branch out. 
So when I was at uh, Syracuse University, we had a number of television you know, and news type related organizations, and I joined everything I could possibly do. I did every radio report I could possibly do, television report I could possibly do, and I just worked my tail off to try to get as much experience as I could while I was in college. The internships were great, but truthfully where it started was right there in the classroom to really perfect your storytelling skills, perfect your writing, and if a professor says, you know, I just don't think this is good enough, don't be insulted. Take them seriously and, you know, improve your work. Because really what is the most important thing right now while you're in college is to perfect what you're doing in storytelling. And that is writing, speaking, conveying your message. So it really all starts here and it's essential to what's going to happen next for you. It's really a exciting career mode. Talk about the internships a little more. I encourage all of our students, and you guys have heard me say this, that internships count for a lot. Um, where were some of yours? What did you do with some of them? How did you step out from that maybe corner spot where the intern said to be a little more involved when you were at that organization? So my first internship was with a small organization that later became News 12. Do you know News 12 Long Island here? Yes. Yeah. So I was at a News 12 but in Westchester County and before News 12 Westchester was an even smaller station and I got an internship there. It's really great to work at a very small organization when you're in college because you can sort of like write, maybe do a little bit of on air, what have you. So the smaller the television station, radio station, newspaper that you uh, go to, the easier it's going to be for you to get actual, real, professional experience. So that was my first internship. And you know, I think I had to work maybe two days a week in order to get the credits, but I worked every day. And I worked as many hours as they needed and I volunteered on the weekend. So I was sort of like, whatever you need me for, I'm here. And, um, that really helped me out, and that ended up getting me my first job on air because I went back to that uh, station, and they knew me being the girl who worked seven days a week, you know, ten hours a day for no money, but um, at the time it didn't matter. And then I also um, did an internship at CNBC, which is a financial uh, station. I did that because I didn't know anything about financial news, and I thought, you know, I'm going to just put myself into something that I know nothing about, and if they give me a shot, I'll be really excited about it. So by doing something like that, just kind of going to, into territory that may not be in your comfort zone, it really helps you to branch out and learn something absolutely new. So that's great. That's great. So, so actually, take off on that. So what would you think of maybe encouraging a broadcast student to take an internship at a newspaper or vice versa, a print-oriented student to take an internship at a radio or TV station? Well, you know, you never know where your career will lead, so I think all of that is, is great. I think internships are super important, so honestly, wherever you can get one, take it. So talk about the thing that you think students now, comparing to what you see with colleges today, to what you study, I study, um, that they need to know the most about journalism. What is it? Big things, small things. You mentioned writing already, and that is important. But other things that maybe you would want to impart to them that they need to know about journalism today on the professional level. Well, journalism today is fabulous. I mean, there are so many opportunities to present content now that we never really had the opportunity to do. Now, because of the digital age, you have opportunities to present your work everywhere. So it is something to truly embrace. I think it's a great time to be in journalism because content is king. So you guys are the ones who are going to collect that content and present it to the world. So I would take every opportunity you, you can to uh, get on social media, create a profile that's very professional, that you think is going to be great for whatever your future career is going to be like. So for example, if you want to be a newspaper reporter, your social media profile should have some really great pieces of uh, news, news work, articles, what have you, be able to link maybe to a website or maybe to St. John's website as well or, or like a local newspaper that you might be presenting. So take the opportunity to use it to your advantage. It's almost like a resume that anybody can take a look at. So if you have a Twitter account, go on there now and see what am I presenting. You know, if a, if a news director was going to look at this right now, would they say, I want to hire this person? So it's a real advantage uh, for you to, to really take that and, and hone it and really make it solid, professional, and ready for um, your career. So in many ways, you're kind of the face of CBS been there a lot. Some of your colleagues also there for a long time. But as I tell students too, you're kind of the face, but there's a lot of parts of your body, so to speak, behind the scenes. Oh, it's huge. And, and talk about some of those roles that maybe don't get as much glamour as being on television, 
but are certainly important in telling stories, doing journalism, the different roles of people that you interact with. Absolutely. So one of the things that's really exciting about the journalism career is that there's so many aspects of it. So you can be a writer, you can be a producer, you can be an associate producer, a director, you can be an audio person, you can be a camera person, you can be an editor, a marketing person. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So you have to sort of think, what do I really want to do? So if you want to be the person who um, promotes the station, there's a department for that. If you want to be the person who calls the shots of what news are we going to cover today, there's a spot for that. I mean, that's what's really neat about journalism is there is an opportunity to do anything you really want. You don't necessarily have to be on camera. There's so much going on behind the scenes. That's, that's really exciting as well. So, so speak to some of those roles. So uh, I mentioned class and in my profession. I was a news writer. I was never on television, but I wrote for other people on television. So what's, um, what are the folks that help you doing the morning news or the news show in terms of their writing? Because journalism is so much about writing. Absolutely, and it's really important to make sure you're a great writer no matter what you're deciding to do, whether you want to be a sportscaster or a weather person, a news anchor, a news reporter especially. Uh, but writing is really important. So if you are on a typical day, if you were a writer uh, for the noon broadcast, you would get in pretty early um, and you would probably go and take a look at some of the interviews that have been done in the field. And so, for example, today we did a, a, a really beautiful story on the Chinese New Year. So you're going to find out that it's the year of the pig, and you're going to find out all of the great events that are happening in the area, and you'll probably go to um, an interview that was done in the field that you'll, you'll take in at the station, and you'll go through it, and you'll pick out something that you would like maybe for the um, event organizer to say that you think will fit into the story that you're doing, and then you're going to write around that piece of uh, video. So, I mean, in a typical day, probably a writer for the news show will write about four stories. So you have to work fast, and you have to be very accurate, and um, you have to have, make sure all of your spelling is correct. And it has to be short, it has to be sweet, and it has to be kind of interesting. So, um, they're, it, and they're short. I mean, you're talking maybe 20 seconds of copy and 10 seconds of sound. But how do you make it look if you did, does anybody watch the morning news, watch the morning news? I'm sure you guys get up at 4.30 with me. Yep. <laughs> so we start at 4.30. Do I make it look easy? Well, thank you. That's very, very kind of you. Um, I, I'm not really quite sure why, um, but after a while, it just sort of becomes easier as a profession. So, you know, you have to kind of get rid of the nerves and things like that and be comfortable in your own skin in order to be realizing people are looking at you like, really close up and you know like there's probably a hair sticking up and you just have to get over it and just <laughs> whatever. Um, but really I think what it comes down to is getting having an understanding that you have a relationship with one viewer. So we're not, while we're broadcasting to a lot of people, really the person that's watching you is one person at, you know, on their phone or on their computer or on their television. So it's really kind of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And so once you kind of realize that, I think it's a little bit more comfortable to do it. So don't feel like you're getting up there and, oh my goodness, you know, 10,000 people are watching. I think the best way to do it and approach it is to say, let me talk to one person. So what is your name? Sorry. Tajanique. Tajanique. So it's like, if you, Tajanique, if you were doing something, you were just going to tell me the story rather than to tell this whole group. So if we're having a conversation, it's just more comfortable than if you're kind of feeling like, I have to talk at a podium and let me do this here. Does everybody hear me? You know what I mean? Because we have a microphone, so you don't really have to project your voice too much. So that's the key, is to, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation when you're doing this. But how do you do it? Because, you know, I am amazed at great broadcasters that I've worked with. They're looking into a camera. Again, it, it's imagine that camera is the only thing in the room. There's no Tajanique sitting in front of you that you can focus on. So how do you get your mindset that I'm looking into this camera, but I'm thinking of the people who might be paying attention to what I'm saying? You know, I think it's um, getting yourself into the right frame of mind. You know, when you're sitting there, you kind of have to, you know, settle yourself, take a deep breath, and um, feel comfortable knowing that I know I'm looking just at that camera, but Tajanique is watching from the other side, so I'm going to try to talk to you even though you're right here. So it's, it's sort of like thinking along those lines whenever you're doing something like that. It takes a little bit of yep. work, but right. after a while you get comfortable with it. That's why you want to take 
Detroit Broadcasting, and if you're interested in sports, <laughs> sports broadcasting, and if it goes TV and film classes as well, all these different things that we offer for you. Okay, good. Yes. Um, so talk about, I mentioned the FBI story. You mentioned the NASA story. Pope John Paul that you covered, 9-11, um, the World Trade Center attack in 1993. What are some memorable stories that come to you when you think about your career? Whether it was at News 12, at the smaller station, or of course now at WCBS. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the stories that was really fascinating, so when I received, when I got my job um, in New York City, I was the breaking news reporter. And that sounds really great. However, when you're the breaking news reporter, you cover a lot of tragedy. And it does become very emotional and very difficult at many times. If you're the person going to the home of um, a mother who lost her child, or you're going to somebody, um, an organization that's desperate for funds, that's going to the closing, or you're going to very difficult, difficult stories. And so there's one story of a young baby um, who was in a stroller and, and um, being walked um, by her family, and a wall collapsed, and collapsed right on top of the stroller. And I raced over there, I was a breaking news reporter, and I was so upset, because I see it right there in front of me, and say, oh no, what is this going to, I, I was afraid about what the end was going to be. However, what was amazing is all these folks in New York City just came rushing in, and one by one, like, lifted rock after rock and passed me, set up a line. I mean, and I'm talking, like, within seconds, it was incredible. They were in the middle of Manhattan, and they were, like, picking up the rocks, you know, off the stroller, off the stroller, off the stroller. And amazingly, the baby was And um, that was one of those stories that I was just so thankful to be a part of, because you, you're able to tell this story of a baby that survived what might have been the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. There was another story that I did that was quite amazing, and I was stunned by the outcome of it as well. I was assigned to cover a story about a missing woman. She was a, a grandmother, maybe she was in the 70s, mid 70s. She'd been, she'd come over from the Ukraine to visit her children, and she'd gone missing in a blackout. It was a long blackout in New York City for, for multiple days. And um, so they just put out a little picture, it was like a little blur, and they were looking for her. So they signed that story to me, and I went, um, and I just thought, what is this woman going through? You know, where is she? Where could she possibly be? So I went looking around, and I went to her complex where she uh, originally was to see if I could get somebody to talk to me about it. And I looked and looked and looked and looked to see if I could find somebody, and nobody knew about it. So we just started climbing stairs. I was like, let's just let's go. I think they, they may have, the family may have been like on the fifth floor, what have you. So we kept going up, and we couldn't find anything. And then we just round another stairwell, and I look around, and I'm like, I think that's the woman. And it turned out the woman had found her way into the complex. We had gone into the wrong building. We thought we were going into the building where her family was, but it turned out we were in a different building. And she went into the wrong building, and so did we. And there she was in front of me, and I'm tr trying to speak to her in her language. And I was terrible at it. And she was like, I'm trying to explain to her, this is you. We, we, and she was so thankful, but dehydrated and really. So what had happened is she had roamed around the city, had been taken to the hospital. They couldn't understand her name, so they, they mistook her name for something else. So when the family was searching for her, and it had been uh, probably about eight days. So they finally released her from the hospital, and she finally found her way back into the complex. But she had been in this uh, wrong building for like a day, trying to figure out how to explain to her. Oh, so it was very complicated, but we were able to reunite the family with her, and all is well, and she's doing fine. So that was a good thing, too. So there are some stories that we, yeah. we did that um, that were really very special. And that was one of them. I, I just love the fact that you're telling these stories, and that's what you are, right? In journalism, you're storytellers. So yeah, you're going to polish it up. You're going to get into the time frame that your producer said you're going to get it into two minutes, three minutes. A minute and a half, right? Oh, yeah. um, but you're telling that story, and, and that's really what it's about, isn't it? It is, 100%. It's about being excited about telling stories. So that's that's the bottom line of this position and, and job, yeah. So you, you mentioned you know different things about writing, um, networking, making connections. Um, what advice do you think they need to hear in terms of going when they are at that stage of graduations coming and what they need to be doing? So. 
Someone told me uh, a really great quote, and that is, success is when preparation meets opportunity. So what I say to you is be prepared. I don't want you to worry, I'm not going to get a job, what am I going to do? But you need to be as prepared as possible. I really mean it. I'm down to the specific detail. Get that resume perfect. Get that tape perfect. Work on it, work on it, work it. Spend as much time as you have to so that when you have that opportunity to meet with the news director, you watch ready. You get in there, you give them your best work and have your best presentation. Even if you have to think in your head, what might they ask me? Then think about it. Don't ever go into any situation unprepared. So that's what I would say. And really, it's really been key to almost everybody that I know is that when you are prepared and all of a sudden that opportunity comes into play, you're the best candidate for that position. And you'll be ready. So one of the things you said as we were about to get started, if anybody wants to know what the news is, let me know and I can give you a podcast or something like that. We'll talk about the future in just a second. But talk about knowing what's going on. Being, as, as I say, you guys know, you need to be well read. Journalists can't just walk in and think they're just going to talk and that's going to be okay. You need to know what's going on. You, you need to be a consumer of news as well as a reporter of news, right? Yeah, you really do. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Remember, I told you I got the internship at the financial uh, station because I didn't really know about financial news. Um, well, when the recession hit uh, in 2008, I had to go on and, and speak about a lot of financial news. And truthfully, while I had done that internship, I really wasn't well read about it and uh, on it. And um, I, I didn't have the terminology down as well as I needed to. And from then on, I have financial news on all the time because I really want to be prepared. So my suggestion to all of you is that, for example, if you're not up on international news, watch it, read it, do whatever you have to do. You need to know some specifics about what's happening in the world, you really do. It's sort of like um, knowing a little about a lot of things. So really, yeah, you, you definitely want to uh, be a consumer of news for sure. And, and the future. So, so I agree with you. I think this is a really engaging, interesting, you know, great time for journalism. There, there's stuff happening that people might hear about layoffs and stuff, but there's other good stuff happening. Too. Um, but talk about the future, I mean, technology, uh, uh, different things coming up, different things. You just started at CBS2, a brand new online network almost, a website where you're doing stuff 24-7, right? Yeah, sure. So before, you know, you could only watch television from your television. Uh, but now, for example, with our new newscast, anybody could have watched it. You know, you go, um, you can download an app, a CBS New York app, or right from our website, you can hit watch now, and that's wherever you are. If you're at your desk and you want to watch uh, the news or what's happening in New York, you can easily do it. You can take it with you. It's, it's much easier now. So it's been pretty exciting <coughs> digital health. It's doing very, very well. So now you can literally take me on your phone with you if you want to watch the new newscast <laughs> and be able to get it right there. So there's a lot of amazing opportunity when it comes to the digital age. Right. And truthfully, when it comes to the future, I don't even know if I can answer that question. It seems like every day there's something new that's happening. So yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and I think it just gives you more opportunities as, as we go forward. Okay. <laughs> technology more that maybe you never thought you might, because maybe when you started out, there were also different roles for different people and technology has changed a little bit. Are you doing like more things? Um, I wouldn't say like I'm editing. Um, we have editors who do that, but I would say that I'm probably um, using video a little bit more, not necessarily to put it together to, to, to be on air, but to be able to look at it myself and to you know, scroll through different things and being able to do that over my phone, and that's a little bit easier. Uh, social media is, of course, a big thing, so we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and um, so experiencing that has been really fun, uh, but also a little bit difficult in a way, because you're sort of not sure, you know, that's very different when you do an Insta story rather than, than doing a Twitter post, and everything is different, and it all takes a lot of time, meaning a lot of pictures, and then, you know, there's these graphics, and you have to make sure the words are all spelled correctly, so it is a lot of work, but it is exciting. And I'm sure you guys have nailed it, and that's great. Um, so uh, there's a, a whole lot of um, new, new and exciting um, things happening, I think, in the journalism field. And, and social media is definitely one of them. And, and of course, the news media faces some challenges. Critics, people making comments about who reports what and how they report it. Um, 
what's your take on, on some of that? Well, I think when, you come, when it comes to traditional um, broadcasters like CBS, I think that when you watch a station like CBS, you know that every news story is going through a number of different levels of management, editors, writers. You know, we take the news very, very seriously. Uh, you know, there's blogs that might report things, you know, that might be opinionated, and that's their right to do. So I think it really depends on where you're going to get your news from. And I think that you'll find who you trust. And that's really kind of a personal decision as to what, um, what you want to watch. And, and, but, you know, just, just know that there are different types of people presenting news in different ways. And so when you go to traditional stations like the CBS, you know you're going to get it that way. And then if you go other places, then you probably get it in a little bit of a different way. Okay, so now here's the turn, right? The transition. The segue. How does a journalist who's been doing this for a while become a novelist? It was completely unexpected. I'm so accidental as an author, it doesn't even make sense. Um, <laughs> And Dr. Rose Ableton, that he has been through the process with me because I've talked to her many times about it. But I'll just explain what happened here is really as a journalist, we search for these untold stories. And um, this one just literally hit me in the face and I couldn't quite believe it. Um, but I was helping out my husband, who is the mayor in our hometown in Yonkers, New York. And he was having his inauguration at a beautiful old manor. Um, in Yonkers, that was the original city hall, which makes a lot of sense. And he was having his inauguration there, and I said to him, you know, isn't there a story or local legend that George Washington once courted the woman who lived here? And he said, I think so, but I don't know, we weren't sure, so we asked around to see if we could substantiate it, or was it just urban legend, and no one really could understand, no one really knew. So I started doing my own research, really based on the journalistic skills that you all have about finding things digitally and physically and what have you. And I just found this just incredible story. So I have a couple <coughs> slides, so you guys can go through the process with me and I'll show you how it all happened. So this is the pretty cover that St. Martin's Press made for me, which was really fun. Uh, but I'll show you how it started. I mean, kind of typical, and here it was, but I went back to the 1800s. Surprisingly, these books are all available, and this very famous historian named Henry Cabot Lodge wrote that, yes, Washington fell in love in apparently short notice with heiress Mary Phillips. And I thought, what? Washington fell in love with an heiress? I had no idea. I mean, I think we know George Washington and Martha Washington. I never knew Mary. So Mary was from my hometown. And so that's where it started. So of course I had to look further because as a journalist, what do we do? We keep looking. So then I, I got a note, something else from this was Paul, from Paul Ford in 1903. And again, it was sufficient to engage his heart. So I thought, engage George Washington's heart? OK, I'm going to keep looking. So then we have Rupert Hughes that in 1927, basically, um, he became deeply interested in the heiress to enormous estates. Enormous estates? What was the estate? That I had to keep asking questions. So it turned out Mary Phillips owned 50,000 acres of property in New York, and her family owned nearly 400 miles of property. And if you don't know miles, acres and that kind of thing, it's so much property. And it was all along the Hudson River, so really it would have been worth a ton of money. And here he went on to say that, oh, Washington wrote back to New York in the winter to throw himself at her feet. So, oh wow, I was super excited. And then I found this, I couldn't believe it. This was an image that's Colonel Washington and Mary Phillips. And it was an image that was in 1896 in a uh, publication called Harper's Monthly. So I was quite fascinated by their story. And then, of course, as a journalist, kept asking the question, well, who, what, where, when, and why? So I had to keep looking, and I did. And uh, this was quite interesting because, you know, we know George Washington on the dollar bill, but this is George Washington in his 20s that was created by uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon to give us an idea of what he would have looked like in his 20s because there was no seated portrait of Washington before he was in his middle ages. And this is Mary, she's in the center there. And uh, she was, I believe, the wealthiest single woman in all of colonial America at the time. So they had a beautiful courtship and um, that was pretty exciting. It all came down to historical research and so I was at New York Historical Society and this is actually a document that I looked through from uh, a, the basement of a church. Um, so it took me like all over the place. I was throughout New York, but I was also in D.C., and I was over at Harvard University as well, which is where I saw a letter that George Washington wrote, and that's an image that I took right off that letter. And amazingly, when you do historical research, 
you can really find it. Um, and so this is a beautiful map of uh, the 1700s in New York. And uh, what I really loved about it is this here is the home of the heiress. Uh, she also owned a mansion. She was in Yonkers, which is where she grew up, but then she owned a mansion in what well, was then Harlem and is now called Washington Heights. And that mansion still exists, so you can actually go see it if you wanted to. Both of her homes made it through the American Revolution. Proclaimed at the heart of neutral ground. So he told the Brits, we can't fire upon it, pillage it, rummage it. Uh, these need to be protected. And in the end, they all survived. So this was fun, too, because I got a chance to look at what else was happening in the world at that time and fashion, cuisine, dance. And so these are some of the images that I used in the book, and they are from the Met Museum's Costume Institute. This is from the digital archives to give you an idea of what would have been worn at that time. So this is 1700s, uh, uh, quite lovely, this cape. And that's what uh, the gentlemen would wear. They really were really fancy and great dressers. So this is from the uh, 1700s. And those are all, um, you can actually go to the Met Museum and see some of the beautiful costuming that they have there. To, to do that. And so um, I took this amazing story that I found and found even more about it because not only was there a courtship between Mary Phillips and George Washington, but I, what I discovered, and you can notice here that George Washington is wearing red because at the time, George Washington, who was from Virginia and ended up becoming the general in the American Revolution and fought the Brits in 1776, 20 years before he was actually a member of the British Army, and he was fighting in another war with the Brits. So as he was courting the richest heiress in colonial America, uh, some of his British commanders also wanted to court her. And so there was sort of a bit of a struggle, and I think um, they wronged George Washington. And so there was this deception that uh, what I found when I was researching it showed me that George Washington went from really adoring the British Army to really disliking them immensely. And so I believe his bitter resentment towards the Brits happened 20 years before 1776. So now, a lot of this information I had to go research because I didn't remember stuff from you know history class. So that's part of journalism too, is you have to go back and look and relook and relook again just to make sure you have it all accurate. So I presented um, this research to uh, a couple of publishers, uh, one publisher, and they were really interested in having me do the story. And I wanted to do it as a nonfiction story, so just the truth. This is what I found. These are the documents. And they encouraged me to try it as a, to do it as a novel. So now it's um, a novel, which comes out um, in a couple of weeks, actually, two weeks from today. Yeah, so that was a really interesting um, opportunity, too, because I knew nothing about the publishing industry. And I knew nothing about writing a novel. I just knew about how to write you know, stories as a reporter. And so it was quite uh, intensive. It was like a, a quick, I had to be a quick study at, at, at developing characters and plot and all of that. But it was, it was a lot of fun. I have free bookmarks for you guys, too. You guys can take something with you for coming here, which I appreciate. Um, but please feel free to ask me anything um, about journalism about writing a book, because I think um, when it comes to writing a book, I feel like everybody has a book in them. So I would say I encourage you to do it, because it was really um, a great opportunity and uh, a lot of fun to do. So please, um, ask away. Yeah. Let, me start, let me start home. We're going to uh, have a little microphone that will be passed around. I thought that was one you one. But um, Mary, take us, though, from you mentioned you wanted to write a non-fiction book. You might think about a documentary or again a news report, maybe an hour-long special. So you turn it into a novel. Now you're a novelist. That's not a journalist. It's a different word. So how did you change your mindset to make stuff up in effect when your whole life has been reporting facts? So true. So what I did, um, because I'm not very good at making stuff up, um, I went back to find out every detail I could. So for example, when there's an invitation to a banquet, I went back to look at an actual invitation to a banquet in the 1700s. So in the book, while there's a, a novel around um, the, the story, all of the historic documents are weaved throughout. So most of it is historic documentation with um, characters weaved throughout, which was, uh, it, it was kind of um, exciting to be able to do something different. Okay, so please, tell us your name, right? This typically happens at news conferences. You identify yourself, just like a news conference now. And um, 
um, just raise your hand and then we'll have the microphone come to you. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Derek. I just wanted to ask you, um, when you were like digging and getting all this information for your book, were you like typing it online, like you know, to write it? Like, how did you? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I was really confused as to what do I do with this because some of them like were was an old letter, and I had it right in front of me, and so I uh, I did both. I filed things very carefully chronologically as to when they happened, but I also kept very meticulous notes online, so I created a file of uh, George Washington materials, and um, I kept them in different, I tried to keep them in, um, again, different categories so that I could refer back to them because I needed to go back to them. It was a little bit confusing and some of it wasn't great, but I did both, actually. And some things I printed out because I really needed to refer to them on hard copy. Um, while I, I most of the, most of the work was done online, you know, on, on my computer, I just for some reason needed to be able to hold some things in my hand. So some of the old books that I was referring to, I actually went and got the old books um, so I could have them. I, I don't know why. It just made it easier for me to be able to refer to them. I guess it's just an old school way of doing things. Well, uh, did you hear Hi, Hi, my name is Alana Mathia. I'm a junior. Um, I'm trying to get into broadcast journalism, so I'm trying to um, basically ask you, what steps did it take you to get on air, and how long did it take you to get on sure. air? Uh, well, the first thing that you'll want to do is have a really great resume team to be able to showcase your work. Um, so my first job was in radio, and I had a radio demo tape from college, which helped me get my first job. My first job was at, as a freelance reporter for a, a radio station. And um, that I did for a couple of months until they had an opening for the overnight anchor, which was seven at night to four in the morning. And I worked those hours as the overnight anchor, and I was thrilled. And um, I didn't pay much money, but it didn't really matter to me. It was just to have the first professional job. And it was such a small station that overnight I was there by myself. So um, there was one time that there was a bear sighting right near there, and I was so nervous. Like, oh my. So I remember running, running to my car um, from the station just so I didn't see the bear. So that's what you do. Yeah. And then uh, from there, I, I worked the 7 at night to 4 in the morning, and then I went into another um, station, which I did voluntarily to work as a reporter. And so I didn't really sleep much. I think I, I slept from, you know, 4.30 to maybe 9, and then I went into my other station. And I worked that. Yeah, so uh, I did that for about a year, and then I was able to get my first job at the very small station that turned into News 12. I worked at News 12 for about 11 years, and I've been at CBS for about 18. Two things on that. Tell us about what should be on the demo reel, the tape. Is it just all five-minute stories that they might do for W uh, R E B T V? That's our TV club. Um, or what would you yeah, suggest? So whatever job you're ultimately trying to get. So if you're looking <coughs> to work for a station like W C B S Channel Two, you'll want to do uh, stories that are a minute and a half. You want to do things that are in that <coughs> areas. But if you want to work in like a documentary under work for documentaries, you'll want to do longer format. But what I would do is I would probably have um, stand-ups to start, maybe just a few, a kind of montage is what they call it, you doing different things, um, maybe for 20 seconds, and then go into a couple of the stories that you're doing, and then if you have anchoring, I would put that either before the stories or after. But whatever you put on the tape, make sure you plug it. So do it over and over again if you have to. Um, and you'll know, I mean, you just, you be, just be highly critical of your own work. Um, you really don't even need anyone else to look at it. I think most of the time people know this is good or this is not good. So, yeah. And then at News 12, you weren't just the news anchor. You were like the co-news director, the executive producer. Yeah. You had other roles. Yeah, so again, with television, um, oftentimes you're not just doing one thing, especially at small stations. So I uh, was the assistant news director, so I would hire, I would fire, I was doing five-year budgeting, I was doing everything. So. You have to be sort of ready for that. So I would take some management classes uh, while you're here. You might need them. Accounting. You know That's why we have you take those accounting classes. Yeah. yeah. Wonders, can I get out of that class? Really <laughs> okay. Brianna, you had a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So 
Hi, my name is Brianna. I'm a junior here as well. Um, so I've been told like most times for journalists, you have to start at a smaller network and then work your way up. But you stayed in New York, which is like a top media market. So can you like talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. I think the other reason why I had that opportunity to do so is I started at a very small station. So again, the radio station was really, really small. The first, my first television job was very small, a very small um, station. In New York City, a lot of the times, um, people are hired from the smaller places within the market because it's they know the area, you know, so they, they know how to say Syosset, you know, it's like <laughs> Massapequa, I mean, they get it, you know, whereas if, sometimes if you bring somebody from elsewhere, they may not know how things are working, they may not know who the executive is, you know, they may not know who the lieutenant governor is, so oftentimes it's, it's, it's nice to be able to hire from within the market, and sometimes it's from a smaller station. In fact, a lot of the folks that we have are from smaller stations within New York. Who else? Just wondering, I was always curious, um, can you please uh, elaborate on how you're, sorry, uh, through the publishing process of being honest? Sure. So, I'm not really sure how it works, honestly, because this is <laughs> and I'm not even sure if how I did it was right, but I can tell you what I did. So, I Googled it, um, <laughs> and I thought, well, it's because what they said is, well, you know, um, you love the idea, George Washington, it's really interesting, but you have to create a book proposal. And so I was like, oh, all right, I didn't know, you know, I didn't exactly know what it was, so I Googled it, and um, got an idea that, okay, the book proposal, what it required, it also required the first 50 pages of the manuscript, so I thought, oh, bummer, okay, that's a lot of work. But, you know, I figured, I, I got this far, let me just start it. So you just started, I started the process. but. It was a huge learning curve, so I presented that. An editor then contacted me. They were really interested, met with them, showed them historic documents. I was really into the research part of it, like the nonfiction part of it. And I was like, look at this letter, look at this letter. And you know, they're thinking, how can we you know, put this together and have readers be interested in it? So that took me a little bit of work to be able to transition from that to <coughs> writing. But I wrote pretty much every day for three and a half years. I just made changes to it maybe just a couple of weeks ago. I mean, so it's coming out like it's very fresh. <laughs> just just hit the printers. So um, it was a lot of work, but really, really worth it. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I'll let you know. How did you discipline yourself? You said you wrote every day. You're on at 4:30 in the morning. You have a family. You have other responsibilities. How did you do it? So this is what I think is that you just have to embrace. Whatever you're doing, embrace it fully. So if it takes another couple hours and you don't get enough sleep, then that's okay. You know, I, sometimes I would wake up really early on a Saturday morning before everybody else because I have three kids, um, and you know, just start writing. It was maybe like sometimes I'd be up at 5:30. I know I'm crazy, but I, I I'd be up and I'd be like, okay, well, let me get on the computer and write. So it really comes down to how much you want to do it. If you're really excited about the project, just get excited about it. You don't have to say, okay, well, I'm only going to work on it 30 minutes a day. It wasn't really like that. It was just like, just I was in. And then, you know, when I make dinner for the kids, I put the dinner in the oven, and I'd be like, okay, I got 20 minutes. Let me get back to it. So it was sort of like that. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Who else? No questions. Let me get Yeah, hot dog down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, hi, my name is Michael. I'm a freshman. So, after all your success in your career, being a nine time year Emmy winner, being a mother, being a journal, being a novelist now, do you see yourself possibly leaning more towards doing this? Did you really enjoy this? Where you see yourself doing more novels in the future, or do you see a possible career path changing now? Or what, what's what's your aspirations for the next few years after doing this? You know, I, that's such a good question. Um, I really love doing what I'm doing when it comes to journalism, so I don't see myself giving that up. I, this sort of came out of nowhere. It was literally like a bonus for me. It was really kind of exciting to be able to do something different. But I don't think I see myself going and, and becoming a novelist and, and not being a journalist anymore. I think that's truly who I am as a journalist. So I, I would imagine I'm going to stay within that career path. Um, of course, sometimes you don't know where life takes you, so it kind of would all be exciting no matter what. 
But I, I think that storytelling is what I want to do. So however that is, however it's packaged, I guess, will be fine with me. I don't have something like 100% in mind, like in five years I have to do this. You know? So you know what I can say, though, is that Sometimes I remember being in your seat and thinking, you have to get this all done within like a year after I graduate. Or you have to be doing everything. And surprisingly, it really doesn't have to be that way. I say get into your <coughs> career and really enjoy it, no matter what it is. Even if you're working in a really tiny newspaper down the street from where you live in your hometown. But I just say, just because you, 10 years, 15 years, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years almost. So, I mean, now I'm coming out with a book. It's just sort of like things happen. It's really exciting. But I just don't want you guys to put pressure on yourself to say, I have to be where I need to be within two years because otherwise it's never going to happen. That's really actually not true. Because when I went to New York City, I was in my 30s and I never really thought I was going to even make it into New York City. And so, you know, 10 years after I graduated, uh, after I was uh, the uh, assistant news director, I was there for a long time. All of a sudden, now I was in New York City. So just know that, you know, I guess they always say it's a marathon, not a sprint. But I really think so. I mean, it's, 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 that's how it's been for me. I think it's fine. Giovanni, do you have a question right here? Oh, uh, let Dr. Montero go first. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, uh, regarding your book, could we say that um, due to snubbed love sparked the American Revolution? Well, Otherwise, we would not have American Revolution. <laughs> what I felt after doing the research was that, yes, unrequited love did help spark the play and ignite the cause. That became the American Revolution. I think that people will look at it, and I would love for people to um, see what I have and yeah. what's presented, but I think there is something there, and I did see that very strongly when I was doing the research. And so throughout the book, you'll be able to look at those documents yourself yeah. and not make your own decision. Mm -hmm. But I did feel very strongly that a bitter resentment was established in 1758. That was nearly 20 years before the American Revolution. And when I went through the letters of Washington from 58 to 76, they're all available for people to look at, which I did look at, that bitter resentment did not change. I mean, he had a certain feeling about those Brits, and it was cemented right then, just right after Mary married a British officer. Hi, so my name is Giovanna. I'm a freshman here at St. John's, um, journalism major. My question for you is, what's um, like a every day in your life or a uh, working day? So after you get it up before. Sure. Yeah. Um, this this is um, a question a lot of people ask me. What time do you get up in the morning? And I get up at 2:30 a.m. Um, I know it's just hard to believe, but um, yeah, my alarm goes off at 2:30, and I'm at uh, the station at 3:30 a.m. So I, we are on the air at 4.30 a.m. We're on the air for two and a half hours straight and doing news of all kinds uh, throughout the morning. And then after that, we're doing some uh, smaller newscasts that are aired in New York while the national show is on. And so you'll see us like for five minutes or what have you. Then we have editorial meetings. And then we do uh, what's called teases, which is coming up at noon. We have this story, that story, and the other story. And then we do the new newscast. And then what's nice is that I'm um, out of work and the, the sun's still shining, so I still have a day. And then I get to work on a book. Hi, my name is Taj Unique. I'm a sophomore. I'm here at St. John's, and I'm a journalism major. Um, my question for you is, what does it take for a woman to succeed in the journalism industry? I have to ask that question because the world that we live in right now, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into. For you, what does it take as a woman to succeed? And another question I have is, how do you prepare for the risk factor in journalism? Because you do, you um, covered the miracle and the Hudson, and you covered the 1993 attacks at the World Trade Center. And some journalists actually have to go to war spots and everything. So how do you prepare for that as well? Mm -hmm. Those are really good questions. So I think my experience being a woman was I think the same experience as being a man. I mean, I'm not sure if there is a big difference. I mean, I just sort of work, work like I worked so hard and just tried to be excellent in everything I, I did. Um, I really had no issues, truthfully. And I think that what I say is just be as professional as you possibly can and just work as hard as you possibly can. And 
that really goes for uh, both guys and girls. And I think it, uh, it's all doable and it's all possible to do really well in this industry. But it takes um, a lot of work. And so just to give you an example, I get up at 2.30 in the morning. And I've worked weekends and I've worked all kinds of hours. I used to work at the radio station from 7 to, you know, in the middle of the night. So the hours are not quite exactly what you might want. But I just think if you work really hard and you get your stuff together and you're prepared, I think there's success just come. So I think you'll be just fine. In regard to covering very difficult stories, I think you have to really understand that um, you're dealing, you're, you're reporting on real people and real emotions and very difficult situations. And so you sort of have to come to terms with that. It has been very difficult and many times reporting stories. And I leave sometimes work crying. I mean, it's really, really hard and very emotional. And you have to sort of feel that you can go back the next day. You know, it's like sometimes really hard knowing, especially some of the stories that I covered were so, so difficult. Um, but you have to sort of know that you have to do your job, too. So you have to try as hard as you can to just get through. Um, in fact, sometimes it was very, very hard to do. Mary, talk for a second. So you mentioned you had to get certified for that underwater story that you did, and you were actually a little bit nervous. So I'm guessing you aren't like a natural scuba diver. I've done it since like you were like two years old or something. Yeah. And you also mentioned covering the story for NASA. Was there some risk involved in doing that story? Yeah, so um, I had gotten a great position at USA Networks as being a correspondent for them, and they had to do really neat stuff. So I interviewed astronauts while they were in space. I did satellite interviews with them, so that was really neat. And one of the assignments, and they were doing this whole show on astronaut training down in Alabama, and they needed somebody to go into the tanks and follow the uh, astronauts around as they were doing their work. So basically, they put a satellite down underwater and had the astronauts try to like fix it, like in case there was a mistake or something in space. And so this was their training. They do it underwater because the gravity was sort of similar, I guess, in a way. So they needed a reporter to go down. And I was like, oh, I'll do it. Sure, what do I have to do? And they were like, oh, well, are you, are you certified? And I was like, no, I'm not certified. And they were like, well, if you can get certified within a couple of weeks, then you can go. And I thought, all right, I'm going to do it, of course. Um, so getting certified in scuba, is anybody certified in scuba here? OK. So I, I was kind of like cuckoo to think that I could get this done. I, I didn't even have two weeks. I maybe had 10 days. So I was like training, 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 training. And um, then they send you down 40 feet under, and you have to take off all your gear, and then you have to put it back on, and you have to, it's just bananas, you know. Um, so I pass somehow, and I fly down to Alabama. And so the NASA's test is a little bit more difficult. So you have to go down 40 feet, maybe more, and you have to take off all your gear, and then you have to wait like 20 seconds. And that means like you have no oxygen, so you have to take off everything. And you have to, they needed me, they had to time me so that they knew that I could hold my breath for a certain amount of time and not die. So I go down, and I failed. I was like, and it was like a team of 10 people from USA Networks there. And I was the only on-air person. So I'm like, they all flew down to Alabama. They had lights, they had everything set up. And I'm like, oh no, they had the underwater cameras. So I said, okay, I'm gonna have to try. So I begged the woman to let me try again. So I go down and like, I am literally like, if I have to die, I will, but I have to get this certification. <laughs> so I literally was down underwater, counting like, please don't let me, to let me survive this. And um, ended up making it. We we did the story. It was great. People loved it. And um, I ended up then thinking, oh well, I passed that. Then I could do the FBI one. So then I ended up doing one with the FBI. And I've done a, a number of underwater pieces throughout my career. So it, I got through, but it wasn't really that easy. But sometimes you just have to do it. But I I say if you're not a big swimmer, don't get scuba certified. You have to <laughs> I have really scuba, I have been scuba diving. That's what I was going to say, now you go on the weekend. <laughs> More questions, who else? Right there. Hi, I'm Gina Bavaro, I'm a junior. Um, in the age of fake news, how important is it to report the news without any bias? Yeah, oh sure, well I mean I think again what I was saying is that I think you need to, I think there need to be a lot of great strong voices, intelligent smart people, journalists, who decide what stories are going to get on the air. And so where we are, we have big teams of people, editorial teams, that move through stories and make determinations as to what 
stories are going to make on and what details are going to be in that story. So I think it's, it's super important um, because you want to tell it like it is. And so, um, again, it's, it depends on where you want to get your news. And, and I think it's everybody pretty much knows, you know, if you're going to, you know, read this blog, what type of bias they might have. Or if you're going to read this, if you, you know, watch a traditional news station, what type of news they're going to present. So, yeah, it's really essential. And um, something that I really, uh, I'm glad I, I'm working where I am because I know they're very serious about that. Who else? More people coming down here? Yep, in the front here. I'm Sean, I'm a, I'm a sophomore. Um, I'm just curious about the writing process for the novel itself. Um, I feel like all that research and stuff, how did you figure out a place to start, for one? And um, was there ever any like intimidation factor in actually sitting down and writing a full novel? Every minute. It was intimidating. It was very difficult, especially because I was dealing with the 1700s and prose from the 1700s, very different. And um, throughout the novel, I used dialogue that George Washington actually said. So I actually thought, you know, I couldn't put words in George Washington's mouth. So I thought, well, let me just go back to what he actually said. So I went back to his words. So for example, surprisingly, George Washington wrote love poems and um, named all of his horses and, and was an avid dancer. And so it was amazing that I was able to find really great pieces of information that I thought people might be interested in. Um, and so I was using his actual words. So when I was doing that, so basically I would, I would look at, a, I, they were going to have a conversation about poetry. So I looked through George's poems and looked at any conversations he had about poetry. And so I started there and then created the pieces that would flow uh, back and forth with that. Um, but yeah, it was very difficult and very intimidating, but a lot of fun, I have to say. But you know, the interesting thing was, I went back to the myths about Washington. I don't know if you guys know the, uh, did he cut down the cherry tree? And like George Washington cannot tell a lie. I know we're going back to like stuff that you probably thought about like when you were in primary school or something. But um, the interesting story of George Washington could not tell a lie. There was a really uh, fascinating story that I added in the book that George Washington's mom had wild horses, and George Washington would tame these wild horses down in Virginia, and there was one that was his mom's favorite. And George Washington got all his friends together, and he was like, okay, we're going to tackle this one wild steed. And everybody pushed the horse you know, into the corner, and like they would put the uh, saddle on him or what have you. And George Washington tore off in the field, and he was trying to work this horse and trying to tame the horse and what have you. And then all of a sudden, the horse just in a violent fit falls to the ground and George Washington's on top of them and they both fall to the ground and, the George, and George Washington is fine but the horse dies. Oh. So the next morning the friends are all at breakfast with the mother and the mother's like, where's my favorite horse? And Washington says, the horse is dead. And the friends are like, I can't believe he said it. Mm -hmm. um, and he, George Washington goes on to tell them her the story from start to finish without any, you know, fib. And, um, mother in the end said, well, I'm so sorry that my horse is gone, but at least I know my son cannot tell a lie, or something along those lines. Yeah. So it was kind of fun to be able to, that's the real story, which we cannot tell a lie. So I went back to look at things like that, just to make it a little bit more interesting for people. Jump down a horse to each other. I want you to talk about the, the research, and, and Dr. Del Vecchio, please add, add to this. You know, doing all the work, you mentioned some of the things, but um, just the, the intensity of the research, the amount of time it took to research it, it wasn't like you found a document that you showed in the photo and then, okay, I'll write this part down and I'll just put it in the book. Yeah, it was really extensive. And um, Dr. Tabakia knows, I explained a lot to her. So, you know, what I needed to do was I started the research around Mary Phillips. And truthfully, if anybody's interested in historical research, I'm really fascinated as to what you can actually find. So I did my research around this heiress, and um, this heiress uh, was one of three women who were named traitors in the American Revolution. There were only three women named traitors in the American Revolution. I had not known any of them. I've heard Benedict Arnold, but I never knew women were named traitors. Uh, there were three women that named tra were named traitors. So that fascinated me, and I tried to figure out, well, what did she do that was treasonous to uh, create this title? Because um, what happened to her in the end was devastating. Um, so I went researching her, and from her I was able to find a number of people that connected between her and George Washington. And so that's how I was able to then find the information about Washington, because with Washington there were a number of pieces that were missing in his story. So I 
I had to circle back. But interestingly, about for this woman, there were only three women named traitors in the American Revolution. They were all, all from New York. It was Mary, her sister, and the minister's wife. And what I learned was they were the only three women who owned property in New York. So in the end, it seems to me like they were absolutely wronged. And they were named enemies of the state, and they're still listed as enemies of the state. But I don't think they did a thing to be named an enemy of the state. So now, where do you go from there? It was really fascinating, and I had to go and look up everything that I could in regard to the names. And so if, if throughout parts of the book, you see like characters that you've heard were actually very significant in their story. So it took a lot of work. Lots of Library of Congress um, and, you know, searches, lots of uh, visits to different libraries, museums, where have you to find pieces. So a lot of times the, um, the secret is in the footnote. So sometimes I would find something in a footnote and then go to that library and say, do you have that document? And in fact, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, one of the documents that has been in storage for 200 years is actually the end papers when you open the book that I found in one of the libraries. So, yeah, it's a lot of money. And, and I have to tell you, you know, we think of research, in my mind, as I drive, oh my God, I have to do research on this paper, on this story, on this. You make it sound like fun. Yeah. You know, I, I guess it's because I'm a nerd. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I really found it fascinating, and it just, like, one document took me to the next, and it was like document after document, and it just pieced together like a puzzle to reveal the story. So maybe if you have to do a research project, I would say to try to find something super interesting <laughs> that you were like, maybe you can find something fabulous in history that no one's ever known. I mean, that's, that's the neat thing. So this is a story that no one's ever known before, so that was really exciting. I would say uh, that... Um, every hometown has history hiding in it, so that maybe you might want to go back to your own hometowns, maybe to that old little house on the corner that you always knew that was part of history for some reason, but never knew why. I mean, it might be uh, something fascinating to, to discover. You, you'll find amazing things right there in your own hometown. Great. Some more questions, a few more. I'll be leaving soon, don't miss the opportunity right here. <coughs> and I think I'm a sophomore, I just transferred here, so I'm not really sure. Uh, but my question to you is, um, do you have any advice of getting over like the nerves of going out in the field and meeting new people and talking to people from all over and just talking in general to new people? Yeah, right. I mean, that's a really good question. And congratulations, you're in a great place. So that's, that's wonderful. From a Syracuse grad, huh? See, now yeah. we're um,
sometimes there is not a lot of time to prepare. So again, you have to, in your own, whatever's going on, like whatever minute you have, you have to be as, as prepared as possible. So when I went into this interview with the serial killer, I needed to be able to have information as to his victims. He had killed 18 women um, in the 1980s. His name is Joel Rifkin, if anyone can remember him. Um, and he was arrested because he had a broken taillight, and uh, cops pulled him over for the broken taillight in his car and realized there was a terrible smell, and um, devastatingly, they found a victim in his trunk and then realized that he was 17 other women. So um, sometimes, so in that case, it did not have a lot of time. It was like quick, quick. But again, what you were saying is to be prepared to know as much as you can, to read up as much as you can. I have remembered a couple of the details from back then and, and we did research and got in there and, and interviewed him for about 40 minutes and uh, went back and forth about whether the reason why they wanted me to interview Cole Rifkin is to determine whether he, these may have been his victims that had still been on Doom Road. And um, it turned out that it was not the case, but he did give us some um, information that I had not realized before, um, that um, in his case, he buried uh, his victims in threes, whereas he knew that this latest uh, killer had buried his victims in fours. And so he said, you should probably make a determination. That will give you a determination as to what type of person you're looking for. It's deadly. They never caught the road. Right. Well, that will be a real life silence of the lamp. Yeah. How about one more? Hi, um, my name is Samantha Wonder, and I'm a freshman journalism major. Um, so you said you've done investigative journalism before. Do you have a story that sticks out as one that's made the most impact, you think, mm -hmm. being alone? Yes. So um, I did a series with uh, two other journalists, actually. We teamed up, and we did a series called Predator Next Door. And for that series, we looked at um, child predators, child sex predators. One story where we interviewed a victim, one story where we interviewed a predator, and one story where we tested whether children leave with absolute strangers from parks and we teamed up with the police department. And the police department acted as an undercover uh, and as the predator to determine whether young children would leave. And we were really, really shocked at how many children actually went into the car. Um, from that, we did a town hall. And uh, from there, uh, a law changed in New York State to uh, make it more, uh, for, to uh, up the penalty for child predators. So that was one of those pieces that we were very proud of, and that we were able to actually have a change law as a result. So I'm going to ask one last question. As you start this new endeavor as a novelist, as you look back and recount the different things that you've done, did you change anything? No, I don't think so. I think um, it's been really, really a lot of fun. And um, it's been a lot of work and uh, very difficult emotionally sometimes with being a journalist. Um, but I think that it's sort of what I felt um, I needed to do and sort of followed the path that I think is the correct path for me. Um, so I think that's what you need to do is figure out what it is that you should be doing, what it is, what, which career is best for you. And just, just again, embrace it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Thank everybody for coming. Looking forward Good to seeing luck, all the stories. I want to see you guys on TV soon.